I was thinking of that song, and it's pretty incredible when you think about it, that we can have Jesus. Wow. That's really, really something. Praise God. Okay, we'll read the scripture, and then we'll pray. If you can remain standing, if not, you can stand up on the inside. Our scripture this morning is out of Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea towards the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not uh, any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, and thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Wow. Now yeah, let's pray. Father, we do thank you uh, for your word this morning and just the encouragement and the challenge that you give us uh, through these lessons. Lord, we pray that you would help us to develop a, a resilient life in the face of all the crises uh, going on around us. Help us this morning to recognize that those can, crises can actually uh, provide potential circumstances for you to work in surprising and significant ways in our lives. Lord, you can use all these things for growing our faith and for just loving you even more and to be a witness for you. Lord, help us to look for and, and claim the specific promises from your word that are relative to our needs as we... Uh, come across them and get them. So Lord, help us this morning and to engage in the ongoing and regular meditation on your word that we would be in the scriptures. So thank you for that this morning, Lord. Bless all that came and that have tuned in on the live stream that you would speak to each one of our hearts individually, deal with us and help us to be overcomers. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we yeah, all know, life is filled with crises. You know, we just, uh, all around us and often in our own lives, there's transitions, there's changes, the uncertainties, and they come fast and hard, don't they? Just same, one after another, all too often. Satan often seizes the opportunity of a crisis to send fear, to send discouragement, and anyway, bring questions about our ways. Sometimes good, solid people sink into such doubt during a crisis that they question everything from their salvation to their spouse and their families, even their church. Others are paralyzed by fear, and still others make rushed and foolish decisions with lasting repercussions. Some become confused and disillusioned. You know, as you name those things, you just, you know, probably names come to your mind even where we've seen exactly that. Well, decisions can make a difference, and we're going to talk about that this morning. There's a, a great old cartoon, a penis cartoon. Linus tries to comfort Charlie Brown after a, another loss, probably another baseball loss or some failure. 
And it says, Elena says, in life, you win a few and you lose a few. Well, then Charlie Brown says, replies, really? Gee, that would be neat. <laughs> you know, the poor guy didn't see too many victories, obviously. You know, he, he was hoping to get a few victories after so many losses. And I thought, well, how appropriate this morning. How can we rise above the moment of crisis and find resilience in the Lord? We find an example of that in the life of Joshua. The Old Testament book that bears his name opens in a crisis moment in Israel's history. Moses, the one who had led the nation through the wilderness and out of Egypt for 40 years, has just died. Israel stands outside the land God had promised to them. There were great challenges ahead for the nation and for Joshua. But in the crisis, Joshua didn't respond with frantic motion. Rather, he made measured decisions of faith. Measured decisions of faith. There's a quote there on your worksheet. With God's calling comes God's enabling. Probably heard that. With his calling, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty sure all our missionaries subscribe to that saying. You know, if you're called, God enables. But it's true in our lives as well. Crises come in many shapes and sizes. But at their core, they are tests of our faith. Crises test our faith. We can all relate to that. And that's why it's so important that we respond in faith. The specific answer to every crisis will be varied. It's going to be different things, different things, choices to make and different things to do. But it's at its foundation, there will always be a choice of faith. Yeah. Choose faith in how we react. When we find ourselves in times of crisis, we can know that God is able to give us the resilience we need to overcome. You know, so he doesn't say, uh, give you the easy way out. To give us resilience. To, we can bear up under what's going on. From Joshua's life in particular, we learn three lessons about the resilience of God can give us in a crisis. First, and number one, that there is potential in a problem. Potential in a problem. In every problem, there's a potential for God to do something great. We may not be able to see that potential. Sometimes we're so busy wishing things were the way we had envisioned that we may not even recognize the potential of God and what, what he wanted to do in us or through us until some years later. Sometimes we have to look back and say, oh, that's why God had me go through that and do that. But we can always, by faith, trust that God can see and do what we cannot. Sometimes it takes us to let go of our power and our effort and let God do it. How could the Israelites have known that they were on the cusp of one of the greatest seasons of their history? You think about everything they had gone through. You know, how could they have believed that God was about to allow a whole new generation to, to take over the, the new land and experience the miracle of, of crossing, uh, this time, the Jordan River on dry land? They'd heard stories, a lot of them, about crossing the Dead Sea, but this is a new generation that didn't do that. But now they're going to get the opportunity. He'd bring them through an amazing period of conquest as they claim the land that God had promised to Abraham. In the moment of crisis, the problem always feels dominating. And that's where the Israelites were. They had just experienced the death of Moses. You know, they, he had just, they found themselves in a cry, go, what do we do now? You can almost imagine. You know, the first five verses of the book open with the words, now after the death of Moses. So just how significant that really is to them. You know, they still, even now, 3,400 years after his death, Jewish people still regard Moses as their greatest prophet. They had lost the greatest prophet that the whole nation had ever seen. So can you imagine the loss those who had experienced his personal leadership felt? They go, I'm sure, what do we do? Where do we go? You know, what's happening? Well, Moses was not perfect, but he was a God-ordained leader who had been God's direct representative for Israel. And now he has died. It would have been easy for the Israelites to be scared to face the promised land without Moses. After all, they had experienced great failure nearly 40 years earlier when they had opportunity to go into the land, but turned away in unbelief. Cost them 40 years of wondering when they did that. 
one of the great hindrances is to seeing potential in a problem is when we remain stuck in the past. Our focus and what we do kind of gets stuck there. The Israelites could have defined themselves by their earlier failure, or they could have moved on and claimed the promises in front of them now. You know, we've all known people who have experienced failure and defeat in, in their past and then have lived the rest of their lives defeated. You know, they let it get them down and just seem to never recover. Well, no matter what it was, even though they might still not be uh, in the sin that caused that downfall or whatever, they spend the rest of their lives feeling that they're somehow worthless, that they, you know, they don't deserve anything better because of what happened years and years ago. I would say this morning, don't define yourself but what, by what happened to you or by foolish and sinful choices of the past. Don't let that define you this morning. While God wants us to be grateful for the past and to learn from the past, he does not want us to live in the past. Let's move forward. And actually, we should not live in the past whether our past holds victory or defeat. You know, sometimes people say, well, I accomplished that 15 years ago. I don't need to do anymore. That can be just as wasteful and, and a bad choice as well. You know, the victory is past. You know, get over yourself and move on. So we should, like the Apostle Paul, be reaching forward for Christ. On your worksheet, Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Keep moving forward in Christ. No matter, Paul had victories, had, he had many defeats, but didn't matter. Forget and keep going forward. Moses was an amazing leader for Israel, but if the Israelites had clung to his memory and then been unwilling to look forward toward the future, they would have missed the great potential that God had for them just around the corner, just by following him. God then gave them the designation of Joshua. Designation of Joshua. We have a tendency in a crisis to look for an answer or a method of change that will get us out. How can I get out of this? What can I do? You know, and, and we look for the quick way out. But often God's answer is to prepare and raise up a leader who will call people to follow God. This is what happened multiple times for the Israelites. This is what happened many years earlier with Moses. God's people were in bondage in Egypt, and they groaned under their burdens. And how did God deliver them? He raised up Moses you know, to get them out. Then over the 40 years that the nation was in the wilderness, God had been preparing a leader to take Moses' place. In God's sovereign providence, Joshua spent 40 years alongside of Moses, and as it says, as Moses' servant. It wasn't like he just all of a sudden got elevated to this position. He'd been right shoulder to shoulder with Moses through the 40 years in the wilderness. Well, as it's on the worksheet there, Joshua had a proven courage. His he had proven courage. Shortly after the exodus from Egypt, the Amalekites initiated battle against the Israelites. The battle is, is when God brought up an amazing victory through Moses' prayers. And we probably remember the story that, uh, you know, Aaron and Hur held up Moses' arms, and then they'd be winning, and then they'd let down, and, and they'd start losing. That, we remember that part, but what you might not remember is it was Joshua who led the men in the battle. Joshua was actually leading that battle. Just a few months earlier, these men had been slaves in Egypt. If you think about it, these were not trained armies and trained warriors. You know, they, they had no battle experience, yet Joshua had the courage to lead them forward at Moses' instruction, and he saw a great victory. Joshua also had a proven faith, proven faith. As Israel finally approached the edges of the Promised Land, Approximately a year and a half after the exodus from Egypt. Just a year and a half later, they were standing pretty much in the same place, ready to take the land after they left Egypt. Moses commissioned 12 men to go spy in the land. We all remember the story. The 12 went across. They returned. They brought a... And they, um, they saw great amazing fruits and beauty of the land. And they talk about how great this land was. But... 
they brought a fearful report as well, describing the giants and the impenetrable armies the nation would face. For the people who had seen God deliver them from Egypt, part the Red Sea, provide manna in the wilderness, and conquer the armies of Amalek, these spies were incredibly faithless. This is only a year and a half. You know, they had all experienced all those great victories and seeing God work, and yet all of a sudden they were fearful, except for two. You know the story. Joshua and Caleb protested against their fearful report. But ultimately, the people refused to listen to Joshua and Caleb's pleas and even determined to stone them before God. Now, these two got outvoted. And I, and I meditated on that, Pastor Joshua Priest. Uh, you know, uh, pure democracy can be dangerous in spiritual matters. Uh, it's dangerous enough in our own country when you think of the popular vote. You know, it's not necessarily in our best interest to have a popular vote for the way we're going to take especially in spiritual matters. We need to follow God. Uh, uh, even their pleas, uh, they, they were challenged and overruled. Although it would be nearly 40 years then before Joshua and Caleb would enter the promised land, the delay being a direct result of the people's faithlessness. Their faith was proven that day before the entire nation. So, I, you know, uh, there's a quote there on your uh, worksheet from J. Sidlow Baxter. What is the difference between an obstacle and an opportunity? Our attitude toward it. Every opportunity has a difficulty, but every difficulty has an opportunity. Very, I used to work for, for a sales organization. I always said, there are no problems. There's only opportunities. <laughs> it's the attitude and how you look at the situation, you know. Not a problem, just an opportunity to, to do something, and especially to prove God. Resilience in times of crisis requires that we see our problems in light of the greatness of our God. Boy, this is too overwhelming for me. God, it's got to be up to you. That's what he wants us to do. Because Joshua did this, he was able to provide leadership for others. Ultimately, they rejected his leadership in that moment to their detriment. But he was one of the two people who spoke up to say, the Lord is with us. We have no need to fear. This is what faith-proven leaders do in a crisis. They direct people's focus to the presence of God and his ability to help rather than on the greatness of their problems. Yeah. Let's get through it. We'll help you. Get through it together. Strive together to get through it. And Joshua also had a proven humility. He had a proven humility. Perhaps the greatest proof of Joshua's ability to lead was his willingness to serve. Not just once or just for a few years, but for 40 years, he served alongside Moses in the desert. From early in the nation's journey until the very end, the Bible refers to Joshua as Moses' minister or servant. And the first glimpse of, uh, we see of Joshua serving Moses was not the glamorous uh, out front thing. He was simply asked to wait while Moses spent 40 days in the presence of God. See on the picture, you know, he got to go a little ways up and there he waited. 40 days he waited. And what was going on down below, they all got uh, tired of waiting and had the party and the golden calf. And you know the story, you know, and, but Joshua didn't go join. He just stayed faithful and serving God. You know, he could have been mad that he was missing the party. He could have been mad that he didn't get to go all the way up to the top with Moses. You know, he said, why am I stuck here halfway up and not, do, you know, just twiddling my thumbs or whatever. But he did not do that. He could have been angry, felt taken advantage of, but he didn't. He just waited for another opportunity to serve. Sometime later, after the episode mentioned above, when the people refused to go into the promised land, Joshua waited another 40 years then, from 40 days to 40 years. Wow. He could have become discouraged and decided that his service didn't make a difference anyway. So why continue? He could have become disillusioned with Moses' leadership. You know, several of them did. And he decided that Moses was to blame for people's faithlessness. He could have even tried to lead a rebellion against Moses. 
You know, he's in a position. Sometimes you hear that, the second command. Okay, let's, you know, let's mutiny. Let's get, you know, get rid of the leader. Well, Joshua didn't. He served. He just stayed faithful in service. Someone once observed that the true test of a servant is if he acts like one when he's treated like one. And I thought, wow, is that mad at some time? Yeah, well, all we want to do is serve, but don't treat me like a servant. You know, our egos get in the way, doesn't it? You know, but if we just act humble and, and serve when we're asked to, then that's what we should do. Well, Joshua's patience in serving was the preparation of God for something greater. Leading the nation of Israel into the promised land. He had to wait quite a while, but it was a, a great honor to do. But Joshua didn't know it at the time. He served out of humility. The resilient life is a patient life. When we don't see God acting on our timetable, often we become impatient. Come on, Lord, speed it up a little bit. We dream of great things we would like to be and to accomplish for God. But when we don't see results, we become disheartened and give up. We expend ourselves in serving. But when no one notices our efforts or gives us a leadership position, we move on to something else. Okay, well, you're not going to pay any attention to me. I'll just go try something else. And it's a very human reaction to do. There are, of course, times when our involvement in something needs to end. You know, there, there are, can be natural progressions and things that should end. There are times an entire area of ministry has served its purpose. Okay, we, we're, we've accomplished that. We've done that. Time to move on. You know, those things do come up. But when we quit because we weren't noticed or when we're just not seeing the results we wanted, we're making a mistake. Yeah, that's true. We need to stay faithful when, when it's more personal than what's happening. Too often, Christians make big decisions, everything from uprooting their family in a move or changing careers or marrying someone quickly with seemingly little prayer and no counsel. And many times, these rush decisions are made in the weariness of waiting. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just so tired of waiting, I'm just going to take the first thing that comes along. <laughs> that happens. They have simply gotten tired of not seeing the results or experiencing the blessings that they had hoped for. So they make a bad decision. Be careful before you make a decision out of impatience. God blesses humble, faithful service. Faithful service is a discipline that any Christian can cultivate. We can work on that. And exercising it daily when you see results and when you don't, strengthen your faith and enables you to be a leader who serves others during a time of uncertainty or fear. When it follows somebody that just keeps plugging along, yeah. let's just keep doing it. Consider David, who knew what it was to wait for years between being anointed king and being given the throne. In Psalm 27, he reminds us to wait on the Lord. It's on your worksheet, Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. One of the hardest ways to exercise faith is to wait. And while you're waiting, to keep serving. Just, just don't quit serving just because you're waiting. Our flesh wants to make something happen, to initiate action. But sometimes we show humility and faith by simply waiting and by serving. Joshua's resilience in the crisis of Moses' death wasn't uh, newly found in that moment. He had been practicing it for 40 years. It had been developed, practiced, and proven over those years that he exercised courage, faith, and humility. And the second lesson of resilience there is there's a promise with the opportunity. There is promise with the opportunity. In whatever crisis you may be facing, God doesn't call you to white-knuckle your way through it. He doesn't just hang on for dear life. He gives you the amazing resource of his promises and invites you to trust in his ability to carry you through the crisis. Kind of that, let go, let him. Yeah. Get those white knuckles. Like that. Again, with God's calling comes God's enabling. Think of what this meant to Joshua. As a proven leader, as he was, he did not have the resources to conquer the many armies of Canaan and settle the Israelites into the promised land. 
So even as he stood on the edge of a crisis, and as God called him to lead the people through it, God gave Joshua a clear reminder of and reinforcement in his promises. He reminded him of the promise he gave. God has given us promises too. And even as he promised Joshua success, he has promised the same to us. We can be assured that the work God is doing on earth through the local church is not in vain. We're not just exercising up here in vain. Well, in any area of crisis, we should remember that with God's calling comes God's enabling. And we should look for the promises that he provides. Notice the promises God gave Joshua in the moment of crisis. Letter A there, there was the promise of the land. The promise of the land was really a restating of promises God had previously made to Abraham. There's a parallel here to many Christians' responses to God's promises. We hear them, we feel assured by them, but we have a tendency to not act on them. Yet God's promises are essential to our resilience in times of crisis. We need to decide and enact. Then letter B, there was the promise of victory. God also promised Joshua victory. We have a tendency during the times of crisis to point fingers at others, to find someone to blame for our circumstances. While it's true that others can cause crises in our lives, no one can prevent us from experiencing spiritual victories. Yeah, that's right. yeah. They might have brought me down, but God can raise me up. Amen. They don't need to change their minds. I need to change my mind right. and how I'm going to do it. In Romans 8, the Apostle Paul lists a catalog of obstacles we face. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. He covers everything from trouble to death. And he asks if these things can separate us from God's love. His resounding answer is important for us to remember. On the worksheet, Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. He loves us. Through Christ we are conquerors. We have the victory. Not necessarily a victory that delivers us from trouble, but a victory that assures us resilience in times of trouble. We can have that strength that's promised. Well, that means in times of crisis, God can give us victory in all the ways we need. Everything we need, peace, direction, strength, provision, comfort, and grace. He gives us all those things. And then let us see that it was the promise of God's presence. The ultimate resource that God promised Joshua and promises us is his very own presence. We can have Jesus that we sang. In fact, no spiritual victory is possible without God's presence. So God told Joshua, I will be with thee and not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And has he not said the same to us? Yeah. We see that in the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews quoted from the least seven uh, Old Testament passages when he penned the words of Hebrews 13, 5, and 6. They're on the worksheet. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall dear, dear unto me. Wow. Have your way, world. I'm on Jesus' team. Amen. Praise God. You and I have God's promises recorded in his word. We do ourselves great disfavor when we don't turn to them in times of crisis. And even as God reminded Joshua of the promises he had already given, God, the Holy Spirit, graciously indwells us and brings to mind the truths of God's word, which we have previously known. There's a quote there again on your worksheet. The will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. If you desire uh, the, to experience resilience in the times of crisis, remember the promises of, of God's presence and his grace. He will not let you down. Right. Praise God. And then number three this morning, for resilience, we see there's power in a decision. There, you see, God's promises are given to spur us to action. We are not just to sit around enjoying God's promises. We are to make biblical and courageous decisions because of them. Use those promises 
to help us decide. For Joshua, this would be a threefold decision to exercise courage, to obey God's command, and to saturate his mind with God's word. These three decisions are good for us to make as well. Letter A, the make a decision of courageous faith. In our verse 6 of our text, Josh, God told Joshua, be strong and of good courage. When God calls us to be strong, it's not the same as just keeping a stiff upper lip, gritting your teeth and grinding forward. It's a call to make a decision to rely on his strength. We are in a spiritual battle, and we are not strong enough to win on our own. We must be strong in the Lord. Amen. On your worksheet there, Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Praise God. With that confidence that the strength, with confidence that our strength comes from God, there will, will God, there will be as we need it. We can have confidence when we need it; it'll be there. If we have the faith for that, and we can press forward in courage. Well, to have courage that rises above fear in a crisis, we need a commitment to something larger than our own self. Preservation to our, you know, our own self-preservation. Sometimes that's all we're worried about, right? How to, how to get ourselves through it. Well, it's a commitment to doing the will of God. There's a quote by A.W. Tozer there on the worksheet. The only fear I have is to get out of the will of God. Outside of the will of God, there's nothing I want. And in the will of God, there's nothing I fear. Wow, pretty simple. We're in his will. We know we're in his will, nothing to fear. In times of crisis, fear arises. But when you are tempted to cave to the fears whispered in your mind, remember God's words to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. There are worse things than the fear you are facing. And one of those is to not do the will of God. That's actually worse. And then B, you make a decision of complete obedience. God not only called Joshua to be strong and very courageous, but he told him that it was for the, the purpose that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. In other words, God was calling Joshua to make a decision for complete obedience. We like to make a decision of conditional obedience. God, if you bless me, uh, then I'll obey you. But God instructs us to make a decision of complete obedience. Obey me and you'll see my blessings. And that's where the rub comes. It's not that we don't want blessings. It's just that we don't like to obey. Yeah, exactly. We like the first part. Yeah. Then we have the old word. We don't always want to accept the authority of God's word or his sovereignty of his will. Yeah. Don't let pride stand in the way of your obedience to God. Humble yourselves to accept his authority, receive his grace to choose obedience. It's a decision that can be the difference between defeat or success in a time of crisis. Spiritually immature Christians have a tendency to be reactionary to the circumstances of life rather than responsive to the commands of God. That's why we need to keep that in forefront of our mind. What's the solution for this kind of reactionary life? It's to observe and do, to look in God's word and to learn how to respond in those difficult times of life and then follow what God says. Then see, there's a decision of continual meditation. Sandwiched between God's instructions to Joshua, said the, the book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate uh, therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein. You see, what we think about will direct our daily decisions and what we do. A Christian whose mind is uh, saturated in scripture is going to make courageous decisions of obedience to God. A Christian whose mind is saturated in the self or in the world is going to make weak decisions, make poor decisions. Beliefs determine behavior. Meditation precedes movement to keep moving forward. 
How we, uh, there's uh, several ways to fill our minds with the scripture. We've talked about a lot of those. You know, read daily. Come to the churches. T- t- tune into the live streams. Get the word into our hearts. I can tell you this. It won't happen by accident. No, that's right. There's the first decision is to, to do the things we need to do. Get God's word in our life. Our thoughts have direct bearing on our perceptions and actions. If you're pouring truths from God's word into your mind, your thinking will be godly and your decisions will be scripturally sound. So fill your mind with that. And there's obviously several ways to do that. But when our minds are filled with God's word, not as a tedious duty, but as a willing choice, we find in it a sense of awe at the splendor of Jesus Christ and the clarity by which God gives us direction and help for our daily needs. To be a resilient Christian, able to make courageous, faith-filled decisions in times of crisis. Don't just have an occasional encounter with Scripture. Just don't look at it kind of when all of a sudden it comes up. We need to have that background. Let it become part of you through continual meditation. On the worksheet, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching you and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Well, crisis comes to all of us. Sometimes they are sudden and leave us reeling, rock us back. Sometimes we find ourselves in a season of crisis, just one after another, you know, the same things come in threes, you know, and often it seems like that. But when the time of crisis comes, if, or if you're already in one, you can know that God will make a way through it. And I know I'm coming late, but I want to share this final story. Craig and Susan Phelps were on a family vacation when their nine-year-old son was killed in a car accident. As Craig and Susan planned their son's funeral, they asked Susan's brother-in-law, Don Moen, to sing. On his way to the funeral, Don begged the Lord to give him words of comfort for this grieving family. He turned to scripture and began reading. When he came to Isaiah 43, 19, the last half of the verse seemed to leap off the page. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Don pulled out a yellow pad and wrote the lyrics to a song many around the world now sing, even today. The chorus that we'll sing in a little bit and hopefully get in our minds and to memorize says, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see, but he will make a way for me. Wonderful song. In times of crisis, God is always at work. The God who led Israel through the wilderness and prepared Joshua to lead them to the promised land, he's at work in our lives as well. Fear paralyzes us. Discouragement defeats us. But the decisions described in this chapter embolden us to courageously move forward with faith in God. Joshua chose to exercise courageous faith to believe God's promises, complete obedience to do as God instructed, and continuing meditation to saturate his mind in God's word. These decisions led to resilience, helped him to be resolved and be resilient. They'll do the same for you and for me. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we do thank you again for this message of Joshua and just uh, him serving and having a heart of service and so humble but courageous and, and bold for you. Oh, Lord, I pray for that for each of us this morning to just build us up in you, help us to make good decisions based on your word and, and on your promises that you have given us. We are so thankful for all of those, Lord. Help us to, to live it out in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, next week, closely related to this one. Uh, uh, faith is greater than our fear. Overcoming fear. Be another good lesson for us next week.